Samoa. American Samoa is an island chain located in the South Pacific that was formed from hotspot volcanism, which means that mantle is erupting out of the sea floor at a stationary location. But what is phreatomagnetic volcanism? A phreatomagmatic eruption occurs when seawater mixes with the magma and causes a very re reactive eruption, causing large fragments and large amounts of sediment, ash, and rock to go plummeting away from <coughs> the eruption site and leaving a remnant caldera. In 1866, there was an eruption in American Samoa that was well recorded. And my um, thesis aims to explore what that left behind along with the varying other eruptions that have occurred over geologic history. I hypothesize that concave eruption phase waves will be present up to 30 kilometers away from the eruption site. And I'm able to identify that using mapping techniques. On board the RV Thomas G. Thompson, I used the multi-beam, which is this right here. It sends multiple beams to the seafloor, and the amount of time it takes to come back to the ship can be used to estimate Depth. I also use the chirp, which sends one beam down and penetrates through the sediment, attempting to map out the subsurface layering, telling us how many layers there are on top of an original seafloor layer. To clean my data, I used QPS Chimera and I produced a seafloor layer. This surface was then manipulated in QGIS. Here's what I found. This is a map of the depth in American Samoa. To orient ourselves, these are the two main islands Ofuola Sega and Tau. It's actually three, but this red region in the middle is a shallow region, and that's where I found evidence of the caldera and different topography that indicated that there was eruption sites present. What excited me most about this image was the evidence of these, these um, eruption-fed gravity waves, and that's what I chose to study for this presentation. To analyze these waves, I used a roughness analysis. This takes a central point and compares it to the nine points that surround it. And as you can see, there's a higher roughness on the edge of these waves. Additionally, there's also very high roughness around the corners of the island. That comes from submarine landsliding and um, different features that occur from the steep surface of the island. This is north of the islands, and it's the largest swath of data that I have. So it's really essential in understanding how these waves changed over distance away from the caldera. But I found something really interesting. Instead of con that concave waves uh, smiling towards the caldera, I found convex waves that frowned away from the caldera. This meant that it was not just the eruption fed waves um, propagating away from the caldera. There was another uh, force that was impacting them. And in this case, I hypothesize, or I predict that to be um, submarine landslides because of that sideways frown. Additionally, these are two other sites I used for my transect comparison. So yes, I was able to kind of stray away from the literature and find that these are not the classic concave waves that um, are what I expected originally. So here's our roughness laid out from the three transects. As you can see on our largest swath of data, eventually we have a smoothing out of the roughness. This means that we are approaching an abyssal plain, the desert of the ocean where not much exists anymore, except some cool sea life. Um, but initially, I noticed that there were three kinds of zones in this, in this um, transect, and I decided to base my analysis on that. So I split each transect into three zones to compare to compare the roughness and if it changed as we got farther away. Uh, so you can definitely see there is a change in roughness as we get farther away. It's important to note that this long data set allows our slope to be a little less steep than these two. I predict that these both would also smooth out if we had more data. And I found it to be statistically significant. Each zone is less rough than the next, indicating that these waves end up dissipating as we get farther away from the eruption at about 30 kilometers. But I wanted to look at the layering and what to confirm what caused these waves. Using the chirp, I would have been able to identify if there was um, asymmetry or upward migration, but 
we were limited by the chirp data. It was, this is very hard volcanic sediment and it made it difficult for the chirp to penetrate, penetrate through the sediment and give us clear readings. But we did find at 500 meters, there's a faint second line there. That means that there's something deposited on top of the original seafloor, and that is our volcanic sediment. At 500 meters depth is about 20 meters thick, while at 1200 meters depth, it is about two meters thick which meant that closer to the eruption, we have a thick amount of sediment deposited, and as we go farther away, it thins out. Also, this is not to scale, but this is that ridge line and the eruption waves going away from it. So in conclusion, I was able to find out that the Freedom Magmatic Eruption reached about 30 kilometers away from the volcanic ridge line, and the waves are a result of both eruption-fed gravity waves and also landslides because of their convex shape. The deposit thins from 20 meters to two meters over 500 meters of depth, which is relatively quickly. And it does exemplify a classic crater magmatic eruption that deposits a large amount of sediment um, that was erupted and deposited. Thank you. that you're talking about, would that be through those, like, it kind of looks like channels on either yeah. side of the convex waves? Yeah, totally. So I did see um, there, there was like a landslide section and it was smooth next to it. Um, so something in the eruption style, there was a large deposit right there that caused it to uh, landslide versus next to it where there was less or not an exact source of sediment, there was not that landslide. Great, thank you. Thank you.